afternoon. Thanks for your patience. My name is um, Andy Nelson and I work with the planning department. I will be your facilitator for the day. And um, I am joined here um, by a representative from the Tenderloin Vision 2020 group. I have Lisa here and I also have Cheryl and Eric looks like he's here too. Um, so I also have Chaska and Tamika here from the San Francisco Planning Department um, who are going to answer any questions that you have and also are here to run the background. So, so if you could, if you have a moment, if you don't mind changing your name with your first and your last name, if you feel comfortable and your preferred pronouns, just so we make sure that we are respectful of everyone's wishes. So the way that you do that is you click on participants, um, which is at the bottom of your screen, and then you can go to rename. Um, so we'll just start off with a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramitush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramitush Ohlone community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Okay, so. We are going to start with a brief welcome from Curtis Bradford, who's the co-chair of the Tenderloin People's Congress. Um, so I actually have to change my share, sorry. Uh, Well, hello, Tenderloin. Uh, it is so good to see you all here. I am so glad to see everyone in all six of our meetings that are happening simultaneously right now in English, in Chinese, Spanish, Tagalog, Arabic, Vietnamese, and Spanish. I am so glad that um, we're able to do this. And I'm really thrilled that I get to be able to be in each and every meeting with you all right now at the same time. Uh, Talking to you live, Mary, that shirt looks right. wonderful, by the way. I have to tell you that. Um, Y'all can hear me okay, right? Huh? What's that? Good? Okay, good. Uh, actually, no, I'm just kidding. This is recording. You're seeing a recording from several days before the program. But I just wanted to let you all know I am really grateful that you all took the time to come here today. Uh, I This process to create a Timberloin Community Action Plan grew out of an effort from the Tenderloin People's Congress uh, over the last couple of years where we drafted a plan called the Vision 2020 platform. It came out of community uh, input from over 1,200 Tenderloin residents, uh, residents meeting with residents. And even when we were doing that process, we had it in the back of our heads that we knew we needed to do this larger, more ambitious, more difficult project of drafting a new Tenderloin neighborhood plan. And so we started advocating for that to happen, for resources to be devoted to doing that. And that's what led to this process. And we are really thrilled to have this partnership with the planning department and all of you, the community partners, in trying to begin to make that a reality. Uh, this is a great opportunity for our Tenderloin neighborhood to really think about what we want for ourselves uh, and what, what we want the Tenderloin to look like in 20 years. So I want you to imagine, especially residents, imagine yourself in the Tenderloin 20 years from now, what, what do you want it to look like? What do you want it to sound like? What do you want it to feel like? What do you want to keep that's good about the Tenderloin today? And what do you want to change about the Tenderloin? Um, I believe that there is a way that we can create a healthy, vibrant, energetic, safe, and clean Tenderloin with all of the amenities that bring a happy and healthy life but we can do it in a way that doesn't lead to gentrification and displacement. That's the goal. That's the big work. That's the challenge. And I think we're up to it. So I'm really thrilled that all of you are here today. We need all of the stakeholders of the Tenderloin, from business owners and, and, and service providers and residents uh, and, and staff. We need all of us to come together 
and really imagine what a healthy, vibrant tenderloin looks like for all of us. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. We're going to wrap up this first round of outreach um, in time to come back to you in, in um, spring uh, with, uh, or with, a, with a draft plan. And we hope to, to be able to finish this uh, sometime in uh, summer of 2022. Uh, to actually have a plan ready to go. So we'll do a whole nother round of output and input when we when we come up with a draft plan. But this is the conversation we're having now about what is what are we going to put in the plan. And I, I really encourage you all to engage in this conversation, to, to bring your ideas, to be bold in your thinking. Uh, don't limit by what you think might be possible. Let's dream big. Let's imagine the best for our community. Uh, so thank you for coming. We got a a lot of work ahead of us, but I believe we can do it. Uh, thank you again. And I'm going to get back to y'all. All right. Thanks, Curtis. We'll go back to the presentation here. All right. So belated welcome again. <laughs> um, and thank you all for joining us at this virtual meeting, either by phone or by video. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction on Zoom, a few principles of virtual participation, and then an agenda review, and then we're going to jump into hearing from you all. So, how do you use Zoom? I'm, I know most of you are very comfortable using Zoom at this point, but not everybody. So I'll just give a brief Zoom introduction. So audio, video, and chat will all be recorded during this call. We're going to post it actually um, for people to watch later. Um, to participate in the chat, please select the chat button, which is at the bottom of your screen. To raise your hand on your computer, you can select the reaction. So that's the right with the right red arrow that we have here. Um, to raise your hand on your phone, click the three horizontal dots labeled more in the pop-up at the bottom of your screen, tap raise hand. So that's on the right, that's that diagram. And then if you're on the phone, you press star nine. Uh, here are our principles of participation for today. So. Um, we really like for one person to speak at a time. We want people to be respectful of one another's opinions. That's why we're all here together is to hear from everybody. Um, please mute yourself when you are not speaking. Um, share your video when you can so we can all stay visually connected with each other. And as we learned today, technology happens. So um, thank you for being flexible and patient. So here's our agenda. We're in the middle of our welcome right now. We're gonna do a brief poll about getting to know who's in the room. Um, then we'll do an icebreaker, some presentations kind of broken up into two big chunks, a presentation and then 30 minutes of discussion and then a presentation and 30 minutes of discussion and next steps. And we'll um, be out of here by four o'clock. So we're going to start with a poll. I think I can do it. I'll do it. <laughs> can you all see this poll on your screen? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, so who is here? So go ahead and select as many of these that apply to you, a resident, business owner, property owner, and then I'll just give you all a few minutes. Right. Looks like we've heard from everybody. So we have about 50% of the people here are residents. Um, 
4% business owner, so that's one person, <laughs> two people property owners. We have a big contingent of workers in the neighborhood, so thank you all for coming. And then about half of you are community volunteers as well. Share those results. Sorry, I thought I was sharing them. Um, okay, we'll go to our next poll. Is okay. Don't know how to get out of that. <laughs> Our next poll is about what topic is most important to you. I don't know if I can figure out how to do the poll again. Oh, here we go. We got it. Okay, so what topic is most important to you? For this one, this is please select one. I know that's hard, but. Okay, so sharing the results. Can we all see that? Um, so we have 44% housing and homeless or houselessness, um, open space, health and wellness are also very important to people, but that's interesting. Overwhelmingly people, most important topic is housing and houselessness. Okay. All right, so we're just gonna move on. We know we didn't hear in time from Matt Haney. <laughs> so he, his video will be posted later. I think he's busy. All right, so now we're gonna move into um, discussion. So this is, you know, kind of just to break the ice for the next 20 minutes, we, um, we are asking you all to share with us what is um, most important to you? Sorry, a couple of things here. Okay, um, when you think 20 years in the future, what would you keep in the tenderloin and what would you change in the tenderloin? And so we have 20 minutes on this item. This is the lightning round. So please take 15 seconds for each answer. Um, please share your thoughts in the chat and raise your hand to be unmuted to share with the group. Um, we recognize that everyone will not get to share, so you know, please prioritize the chat first. All right. I think also Lisa. Hi, I would like to keep the 24-hour pit stops and have cleaner streets. This. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you um can you share a little bit more about what you mean when you say cleaner streets? Uh, what I mean, I I don't like the streets smelling all the time, and people doing what they're doing in the streets. I don't like the smell, but they can't help it. We, that's why we have the 24-hour pit stops at all angles. And these people, the young guys that, that clean the streets, hose them down, they have to do, at least, do that at least four or five times a day. They shouldn't be doing that. Maybe once or twice, but not five times a day. Okay, so you're, you're specifically thinking like people's need for restrooms. 
Yeah. Okay. So Andy, we do have a couple of chats coming in. I'd like to just kind of highlight a couple. Um, Tracy Mixon uh, says the sense of community to keep at an end to homelessness and more harm reduction. Um, Simon also says the people to keep the people and to change the dirty streets. Um, Rebecca, the, uh, she says the Tenderloin has a great community vibe, very neighborly. Uh, she'd like to get a pause on gentrification. Um, and then we have a, another comment here. She says, I'd like to firmly establish a tenderloin culture of recovery and thriving. So let's support a recovery meeting on every corner. There's several chats coming in, actually, if you'd like me to kind of keep going. Um, Carol says, ensure that family businesses in the neighborhood can stay open and thrive, especially the ones that focus on fresh food and less alcohol. Safer streets for walkers and bikers, says Justin. Um, Tim says, I would like to see less cars and more walking in the future. Isaiah mentions that um, they would like to he would like to keep the diversity and inclusion and he'd like to change the community investment in vulnerable people or increase, sorry, he'd like to change, uh, the, the change he'd like to see is an increase of community investment. Um, Justin says, keeping it affordable for families. Rebecca mentions the recovery meeting on every corner is a, is a good one. She supports that idea. And Linda says, keep services for unhoused folks. Looks like Cheryl has her, her hand raised. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, to, have, to have more black businesses in the Tenderloin. And hopefully it would be great to have a cultural center here as well. Thank you. When you, Cheryl, when you think of a cultural center, um, what do you see? What's like the vision for that? I see, actually, I see, I see a center that could be shared with um, all different cultures and, and they could split time, you know? for each different culture to utilize this space. You know, maybe a two story, big, huge like dance floor, you know, the people, uh, yeah. With changing, with dressing rooms and bathrooms where people could, uh, different cultures could express themselves. Anyway, yeah. wouldn't that be nice? Yep. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, it, it sounds like we have um, a number of keeps. Uh, I also like to hear what would you change in the community? A comment from Griffin uh, was just posted. Um, he says he'd like to keep the residents, including the unhoused and community. Um, and then a suggestion for change is more health-based solutions. So harm reduction, alternatives to policing, accessible housing, um, SIPs, and open and green spaces. So lots of really great ideas there. And looks like Linda. Your name's not coming up. Linda, yeah, thank you. Linda's hand is up. <laughs> Hi, um, yes, I, I believe it was just mentioned in that list, but um, safe injection sites or safe consumption sites, whatever we're calling them these days, but is something that um, we should be able to do and something that's much needed. Any other comments on this one? 
Yeah, there's a there's a couple more notes um, in the chat if you'd like me to to continue yeah, with this. Yeah, Tamika, okay. are you good? Yeah. Okay. So um, so uh, the, an email I can't read the name, but eight fifty Bryant needs to go under the wrecking ball and be replaced with a Black Lives Matter community park. Um, and then Eric uh, says he'd like to keep. Uh, working towards community and neighborhood centered streets that prioritize people more than the cars. Um, Eric, can you explain a little bit more when you say neighborhood centered streets? Like, what does that look like to you? Um, moving away from the primary focus of our street designs being for. Um, increasing the number of vehicles that can get through the area. Um, you know, a lot of our streets are pass-throughs for other, for, you know, residents or other people in the city to get from one place to another to get to downtown or get back to their homes. So really focusing more on the streets being neighborhood or community centered rather than these just fast thoroughfares that run through the city at high speeds. Thank you. Yeah, and I, an idea along those same lines is uh, Tim said change one way streets to two way streets for slower traffic. Um, and then another idea around streets also is to have a street crisis team available. Um, some, some more uh, great chats are coming in. So Carmen says keep focus on Tenderloin being a diverse and rich community and to change, create more gathering spaces. So the sidewalk is not the only outdoor community space for people in SRO and small dwellings that have no courtyards or outdoor spaces. Um, another idea to keep is to keep the healthy food, healthy options in corner stores and to get rid of unhealthy expired food in the free food distribution sites. Um, Michael Nolte says to promote more business opportunities then co-ops give residents jobs or training, keep sidewalks of clear of clutter, which includes street futures, um, improve disability access and senior access, add more trees, add more open space, stop gentrification, merge nonprofits or create single ent entity, intake referral entity or community center. Also another supporting idea from Justin is to create more green and community spaces. I have a, a follow-up question on that. If people have like ideas of where, what kind of green spaces you would want, like are we talking like a bigger park that Rec and Park would acquire? Are you thinking like little nooks throughout the neighborhood or is it just overall, doesn't matter, <laughs> more green spaces? Yes, Justin. I think overall, I think a lot of combined with like a bit of both, like there's a more formal spaces, bigger spaces, and not just Bodecker, but also more informal spaces. Like, do we do whether it's leveraging old parking lots or making like parklets out of the parking spaces, you know, putting some cars off the street and making wider sidewalks where people can hang out a bit, especially people outside of SROs. Like, I think. There's, the spaces are few and far between. We just need a lot of in between spaces for people to be able to to mix around and to have a little more space that's not just blocking right away. Um, I think people feel unsafe in the street and feel unsafe on the sidewalk. I think where do you have them and how do you make more spaces, to make it more accessible and easier for people to not have to walk four blocks for a new student space. Right along those lines, too, Tim mentions that uh, the idea for benches for more people to sit on and for um, people to be able to congregate as neighbors. Mateo says, continue making the Tenderloin a safe place for children and families, uh, supporting parks and community space idea as well. Isn't great? Thank you. Maybe let's just take a couple more minutes. Benches, yes. Um, and, and then we'll move on to the next portion. We'll dig into like specific, um, specific ideas more. Anyone else wanna share before we wrap up? 
I just have one quick comment that I was going to type into the chat. Um, yeah. And I was going to say, I'm not sure what can be done about this, but I, I used to live in the Tenderloin as well as work in the Tenderloin. And one thing that I noticed was there's not a lot of the blue box, post office box things. So you can mail stuff, whether it's bills, whether it's Christmas cards or whatever people mail. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that would be a good thing to have. Other communities have mailboxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what's going to be really um, wonderful, I think, about this plan is that we can have these smaller, like, achievable actions, and then we can also think big. Like, that's a pretty simple fix. That could be done. Okay, I'm going to move us on. Thank you all so much. We are going to dig more into all of these topics. I'm going to switch back to the presentation. All right, so um, next I'm just going to kind of share a bit about what we've heard so far in terms of um, these four topics, then we'll talk for, about these four topics for 30 minutes and then we'll, we'll talk about the next grouping of topics. Um, but this is kind of what we've heard so far. Um, so first, actually, you know, and this is a lot of what you all talked about too. So housing access. Um, we heard that community members shared that they would like to enhance access to housing for all income levels, especially the unhoused, low and moderate income residents. This could this could include, but it's definitely not limited to. So this is a very short summary of what we've heard. Um, ensure all residents have access to housing, increase protections for residents to prevent displacement, enhance services for unhoused residents, expand housing services to serve SRO residents and tenants, and ensure health data informs public housing improvements and business activity. So moving, I'm just gonna go through all four of these and then we'll talk about them together. So moving on to the next one, mobility. Um, community members shared that they would like to enhance mobility in the neighborhood. So specifically, it could include, also is not limited to, um, improving intersections by ensuring pedestrian safety, improving streets by calming traffic and protecting bicyclists and pedestrians, exploring opportunities to improve muni and to fund programming for traffic safety. Then in terms of environmental justice, we heard that tree protection and conservation is important to people. Um, tree planting and sidewalk gardens, improving the air quality, creating more green jobs and um, ensuring access to healthy food were some of the things we heard. And then lastly, uh, in terms of open space and parks, we heard that people wanted to increase activities for children and adults in parks, create a dog park, which we also heard again <laughs> today, um, increase funding for stewardship and install more parklets. So what we wanted to do is open it up to you all. Um, we have 30 minutes here to talk and to really just get a sense of, you know, what your thoughts are in terms of your top priorities in each of these. And I think since a lot of people talked about housing and houselessness, um, let's go ahead and start with that. If anyone wants to kind of kick it off. And similarly, you know, please go ahead and share in the chat or, um, or feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you. Anyone want to kick us off with top priorities? Nikki, I see your hand raised. Hello. I'm so happy to see some of your familiar faces. Um, 
living in the tenderloin for the past 20 years and thinking about the next 20 years, um, when it comes to the houselessness, I feel like there's like the Department of Public Health and her clients, and then there's our community that likes to hang out outside. And so there's like a real problem when it comes to being on the streets together. And so one of the things that I really felt all the time was that there just was not enough to do during the day if you don't have a home. And there are so many spaces, even some of the shelters, you know, close uh, and are not available for the daytime. Um, there are also a lot of sleepers during the day. So the idea that we could have a place that says, yeah, here, go take a nap here. Um, go have the safe injection sites. We've been asking these for, that for how many years now? Um, you know, we, we, it's, it's not that we want people to like be pushed away and have their lives broken once again, but we have to make room for the space during the day. Um, and I hope that this is really where we can shine and bring some creativity uh, because, I mean, I personally have been through all kinds of things in my life and have been through drugs and have not been on drugs. And, you know, there's, it, it's a long process. It's not a, I get better just because I'm housed. So I hope we can really think of these long-term ideas, creativity, creativity, creatively, <laughs> creatively this time around. Thank you, Nikki. Does anyone else like to share? Maybe build on what Nikki said. Um, I can't see what your name is, but yes, Isaiah. Isaiah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think I'm good here. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, Nikki. Um, as uh, someone who I just moved to the Tenderloin here in May, so I've kind of been experiencing a lot of it in a very fresh way. Um, and uh, I work, I'm on staff here um, with uh, YWAM San Francisco on Ellis Street. Um, and I, I love so much what you shared because in my, in my time that I've been here, short as it may be, um, a lot of what I've realized is that, yes, there needs to be like a, a growth of services. Um, and, uh, but I love uh, the, the sentiment. And I think it's so needed um, of, of addressing individuals and uh, not just being treated as a community, but addressing individuals personal emotional pain and personal issues and um it's so hard with all of my friends who i work with regularly um for them to to hope or dream or to think about a future that's better um when when they feel so stuck in the day-to-day -day and the systems of that so um yeah like my priorities for the tenderloin um being um of course like i want more housing opportunities um and of course i want um the the spaces for them for all of us to continue to be neighborly uh with each other i mean as much as is possible with with covid um but i would really love uh, cr creative solutions and creative opportunities to be able to engage as a community and as individuals um and, uh, and to kind of try to treat or, or address or reach each other on the deeper issues of, um, of addiction and um, chronic uh, houselessness. You're on mute, Andy. Andy, you're still on mute. Sorry. <laughs> I was saying Jesse has his hand raised. Thank you. Jesse. You know, I, I put it in the chat, but I think 
you know, what we have to look at is is more participatory democracy in, 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 in the tenderloin, um, ensuring that, that residents have a greater say in the in the in the policies that, that impact our neighborhood and engage the um the, the residents themselves in, 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 in the process of solving these problems. We're so segregated in our society that we can live side by side past each other in the sidewalk without really engaging in, in, in any dialogue. Um, yeah, the sidewalks are crowded. So why aren't we having a conversation about how to, how, how to be uh, about certain rules of, of behavior that, that we can all follow when, when ensuring the sidewalks? It's so difficult to to um, to have much less initiate the conversation between, uh, for example, myself and and the and the the, the young Latino uh, drug dealers, or myself and and, and people who are in sprawling tents, because there's so much tension has existed between these groups, or and because there's been such a, um, a segregation between these groups that, that having that dialogue is difficult. But I think uh, it's only when we start to talk to each other. Um, that something's going to happen. Thank you, Jesse. I really appreciate the heartfelt responses. Thank you. Um, Chaska, um, can you read some from the chat? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of chats. Um, uh, thanks for everyone speaking up. Actually, I think more, more people are uh, having online comments in the chat room, but there was a chat that came in. This is a transparent community health data. Um, so more actionability reported, um, providing more community health data. Uh, so the Department of Public Health must lead conversations on solutions to the demand side of open air drug interactions. Thank you. Yeah, that was the only one so far. Anyone else want to talk about housing access or even, you know, we can open it up, of course, to mobility, transit, pedestrians. May I speak? Can you hear me? May I speak? Um, my name is Susan Bryan. I, uh, before 1980, there wasn't much in the way of homelessness. This has come upon this country uh, through uh, policies by um, first Ronald Reagan and later others. But um, they started uh, cutting back on uh, the uh, HUD. Uh, I think they, 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 they really, uh, I think that's when it started and when we started seeing people on the street being homeless and homelessness is something that people are encouraged to blame themselves for. This is policy. It does not have much to do with the individual person. Anybody can have tragedy and be on the street. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your perspective. It's always amazing to hear from somebody who's been here for that long. Anyone else want to share? Um, I'd like to hear what people also think about, you know, their top priorities for mobility. So when we talk about mobility, we mean like walking, biking, taking transit, safety around any of those things, sidewalks, anything on that, priorities on that, in that area. I knew Eric was going to raise his hand. Eric? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For those that don't know me, I uh, live and work in the Tenderloin and I do pedestrian safety work. So, um, yeah, one of the big things for me with sidewalks is um, 
you know, Tomlin has mentioned on several occasions um, that our sidewalks in the 30s were um, narrowed for wider streets. So I would like and mention the need to return to a time when sidewalks were wider. So I think very much, you know, designing sidewalks that are wider and accommodate the increase in the number of people that we now have living in the Tenderloin, but also creating more um, safety lanes, bike lanes, scooter lanes, if you will, just for people to get up and off the curb on the sidewalks with their scooters, right? So people feel safer to be able to ride in the bike lanes or scooter lanes rather than having to feel like the only place they can really ride is on the sidewalk because they feel so unsecure. Um, so that's definitely one thing. Okay, thanks, Eric. And Justin? Yeah, I guess um, on Eric's stuff, I think, you know, the Tenderloin is right in the center of the city. It's, you know, we have a lot of bus routes running through here as well as a lot of cars and trying to make sure that we kind of give the opportunity for our residents complete accessibility to all the options available, be it bus or scooter or bike share or car share. Um, I know a lot of people, some people here may need a car for work and trying to be accommodating to them as well, but also trying to balance out the fact that this is a central part of the city and it doesn't need to be a place where buses and cars have to move fast because a lot of residents aren't are elderly they have physical ailments as well and i make sure that's accessible so i think it's important that we think mobility not a sense of just the options we have but how are we getting the residents and our neighbors and our workers to use these available tools right what how we how are we how are we lowering barriers around that because uh we seem to have all these options here in san francisco but we all always fall back on how can i drive there or how can i walk there and how do we give our residents more opportunity to use the rest of them as, as well. And I think I fully agree on redesigning the streets here. They're too wide. Um, I appreciate like my street on Eddy Street has parking removed on one side and that's very, been very helpful for a lot of reasons. Um, so I think like different, doing different treatments to make sure that we do have complete streets for all is, is important because we have a lot of families here are not probably coming through and we want to make sure they feel safe walking even two blocks to our center. Mm -hmm. Right along those same lines, um, we have a, a comment in the chat that says, I have to be able to have a bus stop close by, so mo more access to bus um, uh, bus stops, and then also, you know, having an available parking place when necessary, so more parking and also more accessible bus stops closer and more often. Um, Wendy also just posted a comment, and she says, employment and education gaining meaningful employment with opportunities for advancements. If there was a support system for education to have opportunities for advancements, having more outreach workers with real resources. Yeah, and we'll get into education, um, well, actually employment and economic opportunities in the next section too. Um, but of course, we'd love to hear it now. <laughs> Yeah, so, so then, um, you know, under the same kind of theme with, with parking and access, as um, Michael wrote, the residents need access to parking because of deliveries and senior and disabled access. The city has removed many parking spaces because of parklets and traffic runs, etc. We also keep on removing parking garages and parking lots for housing until alternative transportation options are, are crested in the Tenderloin needing to maintain uh, available parking spaces. Eric, did you have a comment in response to that? Yeah, I was gonna add on to that, you know, um, thinking of the, the need for parking for folks. Also really bike parking and scooter parking is big too. You know, there's just a lot of people live in studios or in S SROs and there's just not a lot of availability space available for people to park their bikes in their homes so you know especially if there's a multi-family unit you know uh, where pe multiple people living in a smaller unit it, that makes it even much more difficult so having a secure place for people to park i think is really important as well and then it looks like i can't 
I see your name, but you have your hand raised. <laughs> Person with the hand raised. I'm assuming that's me. Yeah, yeah you're, yes, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, this is Claire Amable. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the downtown community organizer for the San Francisco High School Coalition. And um, uh, I was born and raised in the Tenderloin. Um, my, my family has been there for a long time and I have many nieces and nephews that still currently live there. I just wanted to jump in because the topic of mobility and environmental justice is my jam. Um, and you know, tw looking 20 years like into the future, like I just wanted to jump in and piggyback off of some of the things that Eric shared. Uh, Eric and I work very closely together. You know, I second, um, you know, wanting to see public streets reclaimed um, in a way that centers uh, people and specifically the Tenderloin community first as opposed to like actual um, like cars and traffic. I'd really like to see like San Francisco live up to its potential of being a trans a transit first city because that is you know uh, what we claim to be um, and folks on this call might feel otherwise about that including myself and you know I want to see mode shift from individual from individual automobiles onto more sustainable modes of, um, of of mobility, whether that is you know taking public transit, whether that is biking, whether that is scootering, skateboarding, uh, whatever new like hoverboard thing is like the new deal. But I also want to see um, you know um, streets reclaimed in a way that like um, are are catering uh, to children and families like. You know, I, I grew up in the Tenderloin. I learned how to ride a bike in the Tenderloin. And back then, like, we didn't have things like bike lanes. Like, I don't know why my parents even allowed me to do any of those things. And, you know, just knowing, growing up, like, in that neighborhood and, like, knowing that there is so much, like, knowing that there are so many children and, like, families that live there that, like, don't necessarily get to have the same, like, luxury as, as folks or as families and children in other parts of the city. Like, it's kind of saddening. Um, to know that like children can't safely like do these things like that they need to go into like a parking lot to learn how to like ride a skateboard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I really want to, I really want to see streets reclaimed in a way that like centers people in the community first. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Um, Michael, I'm kind of curious about your, um, your comment in the chat and just like you know this this idea of can both coexist i guess can all of these modes and preferences coexist what do you think about that yeah so people who can't see the chat um michael said disabled and seniors do not skateboard or bike ride bike that much and so sort of trying to have a discussion around a um, variety of options, meeting demands for several different modes of transportation. Mm -hmm. Justin, you wanna? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like I, I used to be a transportation advocate, <laughs> but um, I feel in the essence, like lower streets benefits all, like not just, not just uh, bikers or walkers or drivers. Like I think slower streets, I think we agree is safer streets in San Tenderloin. We have cars going down too fast and then alone and slowing them down makes it safer for everyone included, whether you use that device or not. Because if it's slower, that means you can walk more. Like jaywalking is like a jaywalking. I mean, people jaywalk all the time and that should not be an illegal thing. Like, you know, people need to get to, need to go where crosswalks feel unsafe. And people feel unsafe crossing Turk or Eddie or Jones, like that's an issue. So like, that's where we wanna make sure we slow it down and everyone uses it because you know, there are faster ways to get north, south, east, west in the city than driving down our cross streets. Like if they want to go, they can do, they can take Webster, they can take Market, they can take, you know, other thoroughfares that are more suited for high volumes of cars. So I think that's where the benefits all, so it's not necessarily that these, because people don't bike here because there's nowhere to bike and the cars go too fast. People don't walk here for the same reason. So once you make it accessible to other people, then kind of the rest kind of falls in place, whether you are using the individual mode or not. Yeah, two comments that are coming in, um, definitely adding on to that conversation. The um, state would be good for streets and sidewalks to be designed for the most vulnerable of users as the bottom line. And then Clara says, yes, when we design streets for our most vulnerable populations, you make them safer for everyone. Um, 
and then a, a little bit uh, different from, from that topic, uh, Jesse says, have city purchase market rate buildings and convert to affordable housing, increase percentage of affordable buildings in the neighborhood. So yeah, two, two great topics, but still on the same um, house, housing access and mobility. Thank you for sharing. Um, does anyone want to build on what they said in the chat or even anyone who hasn't shared yet? Do you like to chime in? If you don't feel comfortable speaking up in the group, you're welcome to share it in the chat. Rebecca, again, I'll chime in. Yeah. Um, one thing that resonated with me was, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch her name, the Bike Coalition lady. Um, I remember when my when I used to live in the tent, I'm going to stop saying that, but when I lived in the tender line with my son, and he was learning how to ride a bike. We went to Bodoka Park, and he was kind of like, he would go up to the top of the hill, and then he would go down, but I guess there's a thing that says, and this is probably a parks and rec issue, so but there's, a, you know, there's a sign that says no bikes in the park. But I had cleared it with the guy at the front desk, the park staff. He said it was okay, but there was like this one little girl there that had an issue with it. So I definitely think like places to learn to ride bikes, places for kids and families to do activities, places for community members to do activities. Because when you have residents, oh, I, I won't say, I'm just speaking my opinion. I would assume that if you're living in like an SRO, which is kind of like a small space, Maybe you don't have a bathroom, maybe you don't have a kitchen, maybe you're claustrophobic and the only place thing for you to do is go out and hang out on the sidewalk. So that's why I said yes to the benches. So I, I don't know if it's like a social spot, a hangout spot, you know, green space is good. Um, just more things for the community. Another thing, and I'm probably like jumping around because I had to go get my food. <laughs> it's okay. um, was um, to, to environmental justice I've seen people like drive through the area and like throw their trash out the window like bags of trash I've seen he, I don't think he has a business there or a restaurant there anymore but he just took his I think it was like, was like his compost trash can and just like dumped it all over the sidewalk mm -hmm. so I think you know to me that's a big thing you know like how we're talking about like the dirty streets, the having the pride in our community. And it's probably not even the Tenderloin residents that don't have the pride, it's the people coming from the outside that have like a certain stigma about the community. So they just think, oh, it's trash anyway. I'm just gonna throw my trash all over the street and you know, somebody's employee won't come pick it up. So yeah, that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, you have your hand raised. Um, yeah, as you know, there's a there's a problem uh, with market rate group housing happening in our in the Tenderloin. That there's a hearing today on 450 O'Farrell. Uh, I mean, right as we speak, uh, the Board of Supervisors is deciding on an appeal of it. Some uh, the the Soma plan has actually stopped it, stopped group housing. And I think if we can't stop it, I think we should. If, the, if we can maybe put more conditional use requirements on it or other restrictions uh, before we see more projects like this with micro tiny units and community kitchens and uh, it, it's it's at at, mar at, at two to three thousand dollars per per unit pricing it's not what our neighborhood needs and I'd love to see some, I'd love to see it I don't know if the, if our plan if this tenderline plan could address it but uh, I think it needs to be addressed. So that's one item. Uh, other items in, in consideration. I, and I'm sorry for coming to the meeting late. I had another meeting, but um, I don't, I'd like to see more emphasis on a, on our our greenscape, uh, protecting, preserving, of course, trees, requiring that maybe for every new project that comes into the neighborhood that they that the property owner be responsible for maintaining the uh, greenery by, by their property, maintaining and maybe providing other public amenities. Uh, or maybe, you know, ground re uh, retail doesn't make as much sense because there's a retail apocalypse, as you know, and there's most retail is vacant right now. 
but maybe new projects could be required to provide community meeting rooms, community accessible bathrooms, uh, community water fountains, uh, other, you know, pick, pick one from a menu, but some kind of benefit for the community as a minimum requirement for building housing in a neighborhood that you provide one of these things, meeting rooms, bathrooms, water fountains, something to, to help our city, plus maintain the trees and plant bushes in front of your, of your property. Plus maybe one more thing, uh, provide some kind of, use some of the property square footage to have like open space. Oh, maybe it's on the roof, maybe it's on the, on the street level, but community accessible open space. We don't have a lot of that in the TL, open space. And so the only way we're gonna get more is to require developers to include it in their projects. So I'd love to see a code, planning code that required this. Uh, these kind of benefits with, with, with new construction. Okay. Those, those are my comments, David Elliott Lewis, Tenderline People's Congress. Thank you, David. Anyone have any you know, comments building on that or responses to, I know David um, included a lot in one go, but curious what other people think. Yeah, Claire added on that the tenderloin needs to be greener, you know, a big support for green space and open space. And she says, if trees, plants can't be planted, an idea could be living walls um, as an additional option. And then, um, uh, oops, let's see, um, Tim just said Barcelona, Spain and other cities have sectioned off certain areas of the city where only local traffic is allowed. I would like to see more thinking, prioritizing our streets with people in mind first and then vehicles second. Um, and then a prior comment from Gia says, I used to take the eight bus a lot. There are many parts of some Tenderloin streets like Mason that feel really uncomfortable and unsafe to be in because they become very large driveways for garages. And there's a great loss of public space um, and then she asks, or he asks, uh, are there ways to make these streets feel more safe um, or more like places for people? Mm -hmm. um, yep, and then uh, another uh, idea from Michael is to just uh, provide more recreational programs in our parks. More programming in the available accessible parks, existing parks now. Um, yeah. Um, Michael, do you mind sharing a little bit more about what specifically what kind of recreational programs you're interested in? Just the Rec and Park, I know, like specifics. <laughs> you could put it in the chat too, if that's easier for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have about three more minutes in this section, and then I'll jump into the, the second half of um, presentation and discussion. So if uh, well, um, <clears throat> Andy, I did want to say that I, I did put in the chat about a mentor, a mentorship okay. you know, program for these young boys. I think okay. that's really important mm -hmm. to have that in our community. Um, <clears throat> it's a, uh, uh, it's a, it, there's a lot going on in the community here, you know, <clears throat> people selling drugs, gangs, and and a lot of a lot of the boys in the community uh, don't have fathers, and uh, mentorship really really works. And uh, that's been cut out of the city, and um, that 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 proved to be a really really good program. And I know they do it some places, and I think it would be really an asset <clears throat> to have them to start that up again here in our community for mm -hmm. the boys here so that they could strive more mm -hmm. and feel like, you know, they have a, a, a father figure. Our boys need males. They need males. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, that's important, I think, especially for boys of color mm -hmm. in this community. Can I ask a quick follow-up question to that? Cheryl, is there like, are an existing program or CBO or, you know, that, that can be built on or something that. <clears throat> yeah, you know, the, the why not the YMCA? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why not? 
make make that either part of or uh, branch off mm -hmm. off of that. Okay. And that could be done through, you know. <clears throat> You know, um, Michael Bong has the youth center and he does a wonderful job with, with the youth in the community. And I think I think that could be um, a model for, for young young boys. Mm -hmm. um, also. Thank you, Cheryl. And then let's take Rebecca and Jesse and then we'll move on to the next. Oh, nice oh, I'm just to kind of like piggyback off of what Cheryl said. Um, I was in a Facebook group and somebody shared that they were working with youth in the tenderloin. Um, I think the goal of the program was to take them out and have them experience different activities around the city, not just in the tenderloin. And their question was, because one of the youth came to them and said, how can, something like, how can I have a life like this? I'll never be rich. And they wanted to know how to respond to that or how to dispel that myth or that feeling. So I really think it speaks to what Cheryl is talking about that we do need to like connect with the youth and show them something, something other than what's in the community, even though the community is really lovely, but it can be really, it can be really hard. It can be like a whole lot. So Definitely exposing this to different things, different careers, different activities and hobbies. Thank you. Um, I, we have a lot of empty storefronts right now. And as we refill them, I think it's important to try to uh, encourage commercial enterprises that cater to uh, working class and poor people in both price and, and, and services offered. Thank you, Jesse. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the next and feel free to take a little stretch break. We have about 45 more minutes. <laughs> really appreciate everybody's sticking with us here. Um, so I'm just gonna present, go back to my presentation. Um, okay, so uh, next I'm going to talk about these four topics and what we've heard, very briefly what we've heard. So um, we have health and wellness, economic opportunity, arts and culture, and community enhancements. So in terms of health and wellness, um, we really, you know, we've heard a lot, but um, in summary, these are like kind of the main ones that have bubbled to the top. So increasing mental health and substance abuse treatment on demand, ensuring the pit stop public restrooms are open 24 hours, providing drinking water for the public and um, providing cooling centers. Um, we've also heard about um, you know, safe injection sites. It's just not included. I do know that that was mentioned earlier up here. So in terms of economic opportunity, um, we've heard that um, people are interested in economic sustainability in the neighborhood, um, adding a grocery store, providing a local hire and workforce training program. So getting to some of the things that you all were just talking about, and then increasing cultural and ethnic enterprises. Um, getting to arts and culture, um, creating a cultural arts and performance center, establishing a neighborhood cultural district, hosting an annual weekend cultural festival, creating an open performance space for local artists. Um, and some people were saying even outside that that could be really beneficial for the neighborhood. And then lastly, in terms of community enhancements, we heard um, creating drug-free zones for children and seniors, increasing community safety officers, increasing the number of places to sit, so like benches, and improving street lighting. So we're going to go back to what, um, you know, how we 
what we were doing before Tamika has been taking notes and we're also recording this. So we will be sure to capture what everyone is saying, but um, you know, just wanted to open it up to you all to talk about what are your top priorities uh, when it comes to each of these topics in the Timberline, especially thinking like 20 years, near term and long term. There's a, one comment that came in with a couple of suggestions I can read out from David Elliott. Um, required developers to add and offer one plant and maintain trees and bushes in front to provide community meeting space and restroom access and three provide water accessible fountains. I'm sorry, I meant, I meant to say accessible water fountains. If you can flip those two words, accessible water fountains. Thanks. Sure, we'll, we'll note that, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any others? Any people who haven't shared yet and are feeling shy? I feel shy, go for it. When we think of health and wellness, economic opportunity, arts and culture, and community enhancements. So Justin says, um, provide more support and services for communities that aren't proficient in English, um, as we have a lot of immigrants and refugees in the Tenderloin. Um, and another comment is uh, the 20 year goal is universal dr drug decriminaliz decriminalization. Um, substance abuse equals medical psychiatric solutions, for example, like Portugal, and then let the safe consumption sites uh, open. Mm Does anyone want to expand? I'm, I'm curious about, um, maybe Justin, can you expand on the more support and services for communities that aren't proficient? And then Nikki, I'll get to you. Yeah, I mean, I think primarily, like we have, we're having, think about all these creative programs for the youth and their families here in the Tenderloin, but a lot of it is, if it's only, if it's English only or English mainly, then how do these families, like our Arab families, our South Asian families, our Chinese families are going to take advantage of any of these, right? How are we going to outreach to them and get into the programs if they, they struggle to get stuff like EDD or social security or job benefits on a regular basis? How are they going to get to take part of a mentorship program or, uh, or a art center that you, that we open up in the, in the Tenderloin? Like how will be, how will it be for them? Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be very cognizant of all these benefits that we're wanting to pull out that in a lot of services and resources we need to commit for the communities here that are right next door but are not really at the table. And, um, and really how are we building this, how are we building the tenderloin for, for everyone who lives here and not just people here on this call today. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to be, you know, we did a lot of outreach. I know you guys did outreach for different groups in a different breakout sessions, but one of the for us, you know, we probably are part of the big session. So I want to make sure that we are thoughtful that we are including everyone in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Nikki? Hi. Um, I wanted to just kind of step back and um, make a comment about one of the things that I have noticed most um, being in the Tenderloin for so long is that I don't think the city forgets, but I just think the city doesn't realize that we really are in a multiple epidemic humanitarian crisis zone. And the good people who are on this call have been doing this for a long time. And so when I think of us 
and and those in the community who are asking and fighting for this for so many years they're the frontline support to the public health department so i feel there is a lack of communication between departments so that so that we can live our lives like everyone else does but we're having to deal with the lack of communication between your departments. So there's a whole line of things that are happening now. I know in the Bayview where survivor system responses to mental health illness, um, there's a, a program called CART. Um, these like survivor-based system responses are incredible and incredibly important for our own community. I know that that CART came up um, in the planning department to cost $6 million. I know the city gave uh, the Bayview $3 million to um, create that infrastructure of mental health help. So what I'm trying to do is kind of back up just a little bit. And I just want us to realize that if you were in the Tenderloin for any amount of time uh, with family or with people that you care about that you're working for, you can have compassion fatigue. You can have terrible burnout. You can be the best person that you need to be that day and save someone on the street because public housing hasn't figured out a way to place these sick people, you know, like physically ill. That is someone, someone from our neighborhood has to do that every single day, has to take care of these people every day. And so what I really want to just make sure I'm saying is that we, we need a health and wellness focus that focuses on our caregivers first, whether they be residents that are housed or unhoused, whether they be people who are working for the department. Um, there are protocols such as ACE and state funding that can be utilized to work in conjunction with all this health and wellness. And there are opportunities for um, these joint health efforts that can also include health and wellness people, you know, working in this, people working in the Tenderloin can then get credits that can then allow them to have better ladders to get up and out of the Tinderland based on their own accomplishments. Like it, it, there's a health and wellness infrastructure that needs to happen. And I hope that this um, department can really listen and pay attention. And that's what I'd like to say for now. Sorry. There was a lot on my mind, obviously. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There's there have been a lot of people sharing in the chat too. <laughs> just get them to read. Yeah, no, I would like to read some. Nikki, I just want to say that you're getting support in the chat as well. People are agreeing with you. Um, and so I'll, I'll just kind of go up and, and read some. I uh, get through as many as I can. And please, Andy, cut me off with a question if you want. But um, so in a relation to an affordable and healthy grocery store, it would be great to think about affordable cafes, furthering the work of food pantries that can act as a community building space and provide healthy food sources. Um, another comment is I would appreciate a full affordable grocery store here, especially since I don't have to have to utilize the food pantries in the neighborhood. Um, uh, another one, another comment came in that said, I want to see the city economically invest in job training programs and entry level positions for our youth, a pathway program that gives our youth experience before they reach higher education and need to decide what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. Um, uh, another comment along the same lines is on improving youth and wellness of an opportunity. I think we should actively include youth participation in discussions like these, bring them to the CAC meetings and let them have a, uh, the, let them be the change they want to see. Outreach becomes a little easier too if they're included from the start so that the growth of the children results in the betterment of the neighborhood um, so that they won't think improving themselves means to leave the tenderloin. Uh, another comment uh, came in that says, have more resident participation art participant art programs like creating murals from design to painting, learning to dance, 
get groups like the Art Institute or other nearby schools to have their students reach out and guide new program development. Um, and uh, uh, another comment is our nonprofits and CBOs are oftentimes operating at max, cap max capacity at times and even before the pandemic. So oftentimes non uh, oftentimes nonprofit workers are doing the work for city agencies on top of all the work they're supposed to be doing and they need more consistent funding from the city. Um, those are a lot of comments. If you wanna um, kind of follow up there, I can continue reading this Some really great comments coming in from people. Um, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, on employment, let's see where I started off from. Yes, provide volunteers with opportunities to keep them healthy and even better health access and help them from burnout, even weekly massage therapy. Um, and as a resident and longtime employee in the Tenderloin, you will crash and burn if you aren't mentally healthy. It's in response to what you said, Nikki. A caregiver union center. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of um, like ideas around this, like supporting the youth, doing workforce development, um, supporting caregivers. So it's a lot around like connections and support systems, which I um, I know you already have the foundation of, so uh, there's a lot to build on, you know. I'm curious about, um, Gia mentioned this, bring youth to CAC meetings, and I'm just curious if you um, could expand on that a little bit. And you can just do it in the chat if that's easier for you too. Um, okay, so we have about 10 more minutes. Does anyone want to expand even more here? Build on anything that they've heard in the chat or, um, or talk more about like enhancements to the community or economic, we've heard a, a lot about great ideas about economic opportunities. Um, I think another thing I'd like to hear more about is this um, grocery store and healthy corner stores. Um, kind of what people, what people think would be helpful in terms of building on the healthy corner stores and also an affordable grocery store. Excuse me, can I jump in and say something, Andy? Yeah, sure, go for it. I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand, everyone. Um, how about more healthy grocery stores? You know, we need more grocery, you know, one's not enough on Market Street, you know, it'd be nice to have, I think, another one or two would be nice. Healthy grocery store, at least one more. It's important. Yeah. Well, okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, keep the ideas coming, please. I was just curious. Um, and so I think like what I've heard is that the grocery store on Market Street isn't affordable. So it's also healthy and affordable. Yeah. So G Gia responded a bit to your comment or question, Andy, and um, they said it was just an idea uh, about the youth participation since we're giving out so many ideas, but I haven't heard from any youth. I think giving people a safe space to tell people their ideas is a good way to build youth leadership and confidence to influence how the Tenderloin is being developed. So um, sort of outreaching to youth to be able to participate in meetings such as these. Um, and there was another comment saying that the San Francisco Department of Public Health must enter this 20 year vision conversation. We're entering two decades of community healing if we are to survive, if we are to thrive. Um, and then, yeah, some, some people are supporting the, the youth idea and they want to hear more from youth specifically. Um, and yes, we need to make city planning processes more accessible to youth. So a, a big support for encouraging youth to participate. 
Yeah. And let's see, we have Tracy and then Claire. They have their hands raised too. Yes, I just wanted to throw out there like um, about the um, healthy corner stores. Now, I live in the Tenderloin, and there are a lot of times where I would shop down here before I lived down here just to buy things because they were a little bit cheaper down here versus going to the grocery store, even a corner store where I used to live at. And the thing is, we have to make sure that this stuff is still edible when we're going into these stores and buying stuff. And that causes a problem for me, especially because I try and, you know, support the businesses down here. But if I'm going in there and the stuff is already old, that really doesn't help me a whole lot. Thank you. I just want to um, jump in and talk a little bit more about like what I mean by saying like make city planning processes more accessible um, to youth. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel very strongly about like engaging young people because we're here talking about like 20 years into the future and like our youth are going to be the ones like inheriting inheriting like the neighborhood and hopefully you know 20 years from now most of the people on this call will be like fully retired and living happy lives <laughs> that our youth are going to be the ones like taking on like all of these things that we're talking about so that is why I feel very strongly about like wanting to incorporate young people but I also I served as a district six youth commissioner for two years and you know what we mean by like making these processes more accessible is like making the language accessible like a lot i feel like you know my background is also in urban planning and like a lot of the times like urban planning city planning like all these processes are very inaccessible like even just like by the language by default like we also need to make these like meetings more accessible and that means like hosting meetings after like youth are in, after youth are out of school so like a lot of the meetings that I took when I was a youth commissioner were like after the times of 5 p.m. Like city, our city like hearing or the, the youth commission hearing happens after like 5 p.m. So that like young people from like all over the city could attend them. So, you know, and even like doing something similar like what we're doing here right now, but like one specifically just for young people. So those, those are just like a, a couple of ways that we can make spaces and processes like this more accessible. Yeah, those are great suggestions and please keep them coming. We're, we're working with Mike Bong on, on talking with the middle school, high school and elementary school students, um, but it still doesn't quite feel like enough because it's just the after school program participants. So I'd like, I'd love to talk to you later about um, how we can access even more youth. Uh, Justin. Back. Um, yeah, I think also incentivizing youth for the time, right? You know, like I think we have to make sure you know, getting them involved in the city process, it's a lot of time and work. I know like a lot of public hearings are in the middle of the day. Like, so when we see the youth, like to make sure we get to honor their time and their knowledge, like whether it was small stipends or small programs to really make sure like they are getting input and getting involved because, you know, we want, especially in community in Canada, their, their input can be absolutely essential. And we want to make sure that we kind of grease the wheels as much as we can to make sure that their input is, it's worthwhile and their time is, is honored. So I think um, any city process, um, whether it's public like health department or PESA planning or MTA, like we wanna ensure, like be sure that we are really incentivizing them to really turn out because I think they've been disengaged for a long time and we definitely need a lot of work to make sure they get into, they get, they get into the, the program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Isan, did you wanna chime in too? Yeah, you're on my subject. Um, thank you, uh, Andy, uh, for the work you've done and, and anyone else that's working with youth. Um, what Andy and Curtis were able to do um, when um, I was running a, an intern program with transitional age youth. First, speaking about language, there are certain things in the survey, literally we did not understand what was intended. And they were actually um, able to answer all those questions and clarify what was even being asked. So that's number one. Number two, um, reaching out, um, those of us that are here that work with young people, transitional age youth, also school age youth, um, teens, getting together ourselves, because we already know this is going on. Nothing stops us from talking to one another. So I will reach out to SEADC now that I know that Aaron's around, um, reaching out to him since he's got a leadership group of teens and bring our groups together and engage them in this process. So what I chose to do, I could have talked about anything around community engagement, 
but we chose to focus on this initiative so that they were informed. Larkin Street Youth Services as well. Um, and then the last thing, this is for Andy. Um, uh, in terms of youth engagement um, and, uh, and ways in which to embed that into the processes, um, some of your uh, peers in uh, working with the city, particularly DCYF, they're in the midst of their community needs assessment and they're working on their child-friendly cities initiative and they're syncing those together and both of those talk about youth engagement. And so um, as always, I'm a broken record, right? How can we be talking to one another so that we're not on all these parallel tracks so if, if five people are coming to me and saying, can you bring people together to tell me what they think? Well, <laughs> why should I tell three different um, city workers the same thing? Uh, when I say me, I mean them speaking for themselves. Um, so again, um, what I'm um, going to do is uh, reach out to anyone that reaches out to me um, in this chat. Um, besides SEADC, I already plan to, to reach out to you and we're already working together um, in a group. But um, to, so we don't wait for Andy to find the time to do what we're asking when we can do it ourselves and ensure that the information get out there. And we know that the, um, the youth commission is a, it's part of the city. So one would expect that there would be a way in at least through the rep from the tenderloin that's there. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that's still connected to our, our, our dear friend, uh, you know, who already works for TNBC, his daughter who was, was on the group. So there are ways in if we if we want to make them happen. And thank you, Clara, you're the best. Well, I'm the best, but you're second best. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I completely agree. And and it's not too late at all. Like this is this is part of the process and we want the youth to be engaged and we want it to be their plan. So um, I would love to, for us to work together to make that happen. Yeah, some of those ideas that um, were coming in during Isan's uh, discussion were just later times to help parents um, come to and alternate times for, um, to include more participants, um, creating incentives so people can come and also sort of just uh, feel like there's an incentive in addition to just being part of the meeting. Um, and then just kind of trying to come up with more ways to access the meetings um, in Zoom or otherwise. Um, and then there was a comment to say, let's consider measuring the Tenderloin vision plan success partially by youth and immigrant community participation. So that yeah, definitely trying to find ways of encouraging more participation from various groups. Yeah, we'd love to talk to your middle schooler, Jason. <laughs> um, well, I will be following up with all of you on this. I, there, there's a survey um, that we're going to have you take after this. It's basically like what worked, what didn't, and, and hopefully you can put your contact information so we can get in touch with you after, after this meeting. Um, so we have about five more minutes in this discussion period. So anything else people would like to share in terms of our topics, which are health and wellness, economic opportunity, arts and culture, and community enhancements or, um, uh, yeah, quality of life. Yeah, Isaiah. Yeah, on um, health and wellness, and it's a little bit of a, a sidetrack from the topic of uh, teen and youth engagement, um, which is really, really important. And I love that the conversation isn't happening. Um, and we've talked about um, wanting to see safe injection sites or safe consumption sites. Um, and what I would really love in this uh, the talking about multiple people on parallel paths, um, not necessarily communicating with each other, is that once this is something that is established, hopefully it's something that it can be established, I would also love to see um, low barrier. Uh -oh. We 
low barrier. <laughs> Bummer. Oh, are you back? I think I'm. I think I might be. Most okay. of it seems uh, loaded. I have no idea what happened there. The window just closed on me. Um, yeah, um, but I would, uh, in the time that I've spent working with uh, trying to help a friend of mine um, become clean and sober who want that, um, there is a lack of low barrier uh, rehab centers and detox centers. Um, and, and low barrier obviously meaning um, something that doesn't require them to jump through a million hurdles uh, to be able to, to do that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's something that I would love to see on a health and a wellness level is that the, the uh, safety and harm reduction, but then also having partners um, to, to go alongside with that. So that when people decide, or if people decide that this is a change that they want to make in their life, um, that they do have uh, low barrier options to allow them to be able to transition to that um, ideally seamless. Thank you, Isaiah, you're frozen again, but <laughs> is, would anyone else like to, you know, kind of build on that? I see that Curtis put something in the chat about 24 hour mental health and substance use treatment on demand. Okay. Any last comments before we can close it up for now? We're not done. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, I'm going to go back to the presentation. So, as I said, thank you so much. Um, we This is just the first phase, so we're going to take everything that you've shared with us today and it will be, it will directly inform the plan as will 800 survey responses that we've gotten and a bunch of other conversations we've had with community groups and community meetings. Um, we're still in this phase though until the end of the month. Um, so we have an evaluation form and I think, uh, Chas, could you put it, um, could you put it in the chat? And then also we will be posting this meeting as well as the one that happens in Chinese, in Spanish, in Arabic, in Vietnamese, and in Tagalog on our website. Um, and that is on the San Francisco planning website. So if Chaska doesn't mind posting that as well. Um, I think Curtis would like to share a couple of minutes to share thanks for everyone. So Curtis, do you wanna? Can I turn your mic on? Sure, hi, thanks everybody. Um, and thank you, Andy. Uh, uh, a minute to um, tell everybody thank you. So I've been here this whole time and listening the whole time. Um, I, I haven't spoken much or shared much during this meeting because I get to do that often. And I, I really, this really was a listening session and I really am so grateful that you all came today, that you were open and shared your ideas and your thoughts. And uh, it was really great hearing everyone's input. And I look forward to having more discussions uh, with you all in the future, but I mostly just, I really just wanted to take a minute to say, thank you for your, your dedication to this neighborhood, to this community and for um, being willing to do this, this difficult work. So thank you for being here today and thank you for your input. I look forward to working more with you all in the future on this. Let's get it done. Thank you, Curtis. And yeah, we're, we, we still would love it if you all could help us spread the word um, about the plan. And there's still an online survey people can participate in. Um, there's also the Tenderloin Vision 2020 meetings on Wednesdays from three to four o'clock. Um, and maybe Curtis, if you could share the Zoom link to that so people have it and could participate. And I'd also like to say thank you to the planning staff that joined me here today. So thanks to Chaska and Tanika and to all of you for um, 
your ongoing participation. Um, I'm really, really grateful and um, look forward to working more and more together over the next year.